The Herm Edwards star at Arizona State is obviously tarnished at this point, but uh, how badly and will it be substantiated? Of course, innocent until proven guilty. Uh, the NCAA is currently investigating and uh, no word has come back from uh, Arizona State in particular because of the investigation and the um, protocol that follows. We got Michelle Gardner on the line from Arizona Republic to help us break down the uh, situation involving football at Arizona State. Hey, Michelle. Hey, never a dull moment. I guess not for you coming off vacation and you found all this out. Well, yeah, it literally broke the day I went on vacation. So conveniently enough. So basically what happened and correct me along the lines of uh, the facts, but uh, generally there were student athletes, high school student athletes brought onto campus during the COVID dead period, which didn't end until May 31st. And the incidents that I've seen cited go back to the football season in regards to apparently, allegedly, uh, housing some student athletes for a day or two as they had a campus tour visit, uh, taking them to a football game or two, that sort of thing. That That's what I've seen and that's what I've read. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. And supposedly they were sneaking, if you will, players into a suite during a home game. Now, ASU only had one home game last year, and that was against UCLA. So if they were on campus during games, that was literally the only incidents it could have been because that was the only home game they had. Uh, and then again, the, the major thing is having kids on campus during what was the dead period, which didn't until June 1st. Uh, so we'll see how many we don't really know at this point how many student athletes that involved and which coaches were involved. So I think that um, when we know more about that, then we'll know more what penalties may or may not come. And you bring up an interesting point because at any other time, this would only involve a violation that in, that uh, speaks to a competitive advantage taken over your rivals, over the other teams in the conference and across the nation, is that you are gaining a recruiting edge to gain uh, possibly a student athlete. But in this situation, there's also the health issue, the safety issue of putting them, regardless of your, your stance on COVID and how... Uh, adverse the situation was and how severe the situation was. Uh, of course, there were guidelines in place and, um, you know, putting the student athletes in jeopardy from that standpoint as well. Right. And, you know, when you look at, uh, it's a bad look for ASU. No school played fewer games last year than ASU. They only had four games because of COVID. Herm Edwards had COVID. Half the coaching staff had COVID. So it's a bad look when you've got half your staff and, and, and from what we can hear and gather, at least a dozen players that had COVID, um, almost kind of like you're flaunting the, the protocols by having all these people on campus when you're, your school was probably the most affected of any in the Pac-12. So not a good look for ASU. As stated off the top, innocent until proven guilty. So that um, approach should always be taken, at least where I sit. So we, we discussed this from the standpoint of if this is true, then what? Uh, I think the other shocking portion of this was that it was Herm Edwards and a staff led by Herm Edwards, who has a, a sterling reputation of being above board, doing the right thing, uh, and, and just being a class act and a man of integrity. Absolutely. And I, I, that kind of had me shattered at the core of what I heard about all this, because you know, any of us that have dealt with Herm on a day-to-day -day basis, we just love him. I mean, he's so candid, he's articulate, he's engaging, and you definitely get to feel like he's a guy that does the right thing. I mean, he always says the right thing, and um, so to me, that is one of the more devastating things about this, because I, I think of Herm as a very stand-up guy and somebody with integrity, so depending how much he did or didn't know, that has me very disappointed. The other portion of this, and I bring this up every time there's a situation like this, is that there are a portion of people or a portion of situations where people have the incentive and motive to do the right thing for the sheer reason of just wanting to do the right thing, helping people, doing the right thing, being above board, just for the sheer incentive of just being a good person and doing the right thing. But then there's also the incentive of you do the right thing because you don't want to get in trouble. 
because you don't want to lose money, because you don't want to be penalized, because you don't want to lose a job. All those things are incentives of why we have laws out there, uh, because not everybody's just going to do the right thing for the sake of doing the right thing. That's what is a bit shocking about this as well. The risk that is taken to break these rules, especially under these circumstances, versus the possible what seems to be a minuscule gain in recruiting advantage with a couple of players just doesn't seem to be a risk reward that you would want to take. I agree. And, you know, the other thing, you look at the year that ASU was lined up to have, they've got 20 returning starters. This is the year that everybody on this staff's been po pointing towards since Herb got the job. Year four, I hate to count even last year, even since it was such a minuscule part of the season in four games. But, you know, this is the year that ASU had been pointing toward, that they had looked toward with all these guys returning and not just returning starters, guys that are in their third and fourth years as starters. So, again, I agree with what you say is why take a risk like this when all the stars are pointing in your direction for this to be your year? And depending on the value system of the players that you bring on campus, you got to wonder, are you really gaining an advantage? Or, or maybe this puts a signal in their minds when they compare their relationships with other coaching staffs and what they were willing or not willing to do that it actually would turn out to be with some student athletes a negative Absolutely. Um, you know, you, you just never know what's going to be the turning point in a kid's mind. You just don't know. And, you know, there was even a recruit recently that made his decision and decided for Missouri that ASU, we, we all kind of lined up and thought they were going to get. And at the 11th hour, he changed from ASU and, and the projection was Missouri and he went to Missouri. So is that a case of the first of what could be other athletes changing their mind because of the uncertainty of this thing hanging over the head? Yeah. How many times does a 17 or 18 year old get caught in a situation where, oh, they think it's cool. They think it's fun. They think it's entertaining in the moment. And they actually think the adult who's responsible for helping them do whatever it is. Oh, they're kind of cool. But then maybe a month, maybe a year later, whatever they think. I don't have a whole lot of respect for that individual. <laughs> like, like that was fun. And that was kind of right. cool that they were able to do that. But really, is that uh, somebody that I can respect? So, you know, yeah, it just doesn't make sense. Yeah, you, right know, never know how the, you never know how the parents are weighing in on that, too. And like I said, I think the player we're talking about here is a Deshaun Woods, who his decision was between ASU and Missouri, and a couple of days ago did declare for Missouri. And all the projections I had heard right up until the previous day had him going to ASU. So was this thing part of the decision? I guess we'll never know unless we hear from him himself. And in terms of the time span that's taken place since this story broke versus where we are right now on July 9th, uh, it's probably too small of a sample size. There are recruits committing across the country. Uh, of course, uh, dead period, as we mentioned, through May 31st, a lot of visitations over the course of the month of June, and now we're getting a lot of commits in. So probably too early to, to recognize any kind of uh, ramifications here. Yeah, and you look at ASU's got four four-star recruits, including a kid named Larry Turner Gooden out of Bishop Alamany in California, and he's a really, really good player. They got him really, really early, I want to say in early March, uh, and then they got a couple kids out of what was Hallandale, but the two kids have now gone to Miami Central, a pair of safeties, and Alfonso Allen and Jalen Marshall. Those were good gets for ASU, too. So early on, they really seem to be getting some traction and getting unprecedented, having unprecedented success for March. These kids committed right about the same time that they were going through spring practice. So early on, the indications were, hey, this is going to be a good haul for ASU. And then it's kind of quieted a little bit lately. Yeah, I'm no recruiting expert, but uh, I look at these lists every day. Uh, and have a pretty good feel for what makes sense and what works uh, from a mathematics standpoint. And having the 56 rated class in the country right now, according to 247 Sports, has more to do with only having six commits. The quality of the class is extremely high. Four, as you mentioned, four four stars. Uh, most of the, the teams that I look across the country are in the 12 to 15 commit range. So they were off to a great start. Absolutely. And again, 
you know, I look at those recruiting ratings too. And like you said, I think when you look at Arizona being ahead of Arizona State in the recruiting rankings, that's not going to happen. It's probably not going to stay like that. But that, again, is the number of recruits that Arizona's got in. And the recruits Arizona's got in are three-star recruits. So that's where we're at. I think we've got to see where things go the next couple of months before you start looking and saying, uh-oh, this is having an effect or it's not having an effect. Got Michelle Gardner on the line from Arizona Republic. She's joined us a number of times to break down Arizona State football and, of course, the Sun Devils, typically, depending on your publication, ranked in that 15 to 20, 25 range. I've seen them very high. I've got them at uh, 14 or 15 on my way too early top 25 as well. I really like what they got coming back, led by, of course, Jaden Daniels. So, Michelle, hopefully we can have you back in the next several weeks as we get close to August camp and we can uh, break down the uh, team offense and defense. Absolutely. And like I said, I mean, just having the COVID last year where we really didn't go to games and they only had four games, it kind of makes me look forward to this season even more because it's normalcy. It's back to being at practice every day and talking to the coaches face to face. And given what ASU's got coming back, again, we, we kind of had had this on our radar and they're going to be really good. And maybe as many as 12 guys getting drafted next year if all goes well. So you know, we were all excited about this year. Now this has definitely thrown a dark cloud over the situation. Yeah, it's a shame. It is a shame. It should be quite a Pac-12 South Division race, and hopefully Arizona State's eligible to win it and go to the conference championship game. All right, Michelle, thanks for stopping by. I appreciate it. Okay, anytime.